Hi. I'm honored to welcome our keynote speaker, Acting FCC Chairman Michael Copps. Chairman Copps is a hero to musicians and to listeners. We're very excited he is moving from the minority to the majority on the FCC. Chairman Copps has consistently reached out to musicians, and he's acknowledged the FCC's obligation to listen to the public, and in fact held field hearings all around the country to hear from the public. So without further ado, I welcome FCC Chair Michael Copps. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, one and all. I appreciate the nice introduction. You don't often get called a hero, but I'm not, but it really sounds good, so I, I appreciate that. Uh, and it is good to be, uh, be here. I accepted this invitation long before I had any idea I was going to be acting chairman of the FCC, and uh, more particularly that there were going to be a million and one last minute questions having to do with this messy DTV transition that we're in. But, uh, but I did want to come down, uh, even on the run, and say a few words and uh, renew some old friendships. So thank you uh, very much to, uh, for having me. You and I have been through a lot together, uh, fighting the good fight for our shared goals of localism and diversity and competition, all those things that undergird the public interest in broadcasting. And uh, I'm pleased to report that after a long cold winter, and with all due respect to Puxatawney Phil, the warm spring breezes are blowing in Washington, and they are blowing across America. Uh, so I don't need to tell anybody here that times have changed since last we gathered. And that's, uh, you know, the, the future we've been seeking all these years may finally be within our grasp, and that's, that's a comforting thought, but Let's not be under any illusions either that uh, the road that we're going to have to go down to make all this happen is not going to be a comfortable road, and it will require a lot of planning and speaking and writing and singing and building grassroots like never before if we're going to bring home the good things that you and I have been working on low these many years. But first let me tell you a little bit about what I've been doing <coughs> in the 20 days that I have been acting chairman of the Federal Communications Commission. 20 days is not time to remake many worlds, uh, to be sure, but one world that I am trying to remake is the commission itself, FCC world. For starters, that means opening the lines of communication within the FCC, communications among commissioners, communications between commissioners and bureaus, and communications among the various bureaus and offices that comprise the FCC. I've already moved to make sure commissioners can get the information and analysis they need from the bureaus, uh, generally without having to go through the chairman's office first. Believe it or not, that's not the way it has always been recently, but we're going to go back to that kind of, <coughs> of a reality. I've also begun weekly meetings with the uh, chairman's office and the bureaus and asked representatives of my commissioner colleagues uh, to attend those meetings so that they can know what's going on at the same time that the chairman learns about what's going on. And I intend to circulate uh, papers and options, papers and recommendations from the Bureau to my colleagues uh, shortly after uh, I get them in the chairman's office. I think that's just kind of basic standard operating procedure that we should be following, but we have not always followed. But it has to go beyond uh, those first few steps that I've taken. I have always believed that our government's independent regulatory agencies were set up to serve the public interest. Many of them, uh, my own included, have sometimes strayed, and they've sometimes strayed pretty far from that purpose. At the FCC, and I am singling out no specific regime or individual here, <clears throat> over time our processes have become opaque rather than transparent. Too often we spend our days refereeing disputes between well-heeled interests with consumers outside the loop of discussion and decision. Consumers don't usually have armadas of lawyers and lobbyists and corporate representatives to apprise them of what's going on and to fight for their interests. Now, don't get me wrong, they've got folks like you and other consumer and advocacy groups and you have accomplished a whole lot. 
but it's still not a level playing field, and you know that as well as I do. It's not even close to being a level playing field. Even when consumers are clever enough to find where that public record is and go look at it, usually what they'll find is something like an ex parte uh, presentation, and that's, su that's supposed to convey what meetings are, are all about between commissioners and representatives of outside interests. Uh, and what you'll find is ex parte uh, uh, presentations that give very little information at all, sometimes not more than, gee, uh, uh, such and such incorporated, met with Commissioner Copps on February 11th to discuss retransmission consent. Now, how's that for not giving a clue about what's really going on at the FCC? It's nice to know who met with who, that's helpful, but it's uh, also nice, even a little bit nicer to know what was said in those meetings and what decision we're tending toward. Our agency also needs to cultivate the virtue of predictability, and that means making policy through rules and not through whim. It means making sure those rules are founded on good data, good credible fact gathering, fact based, sustainable in court, in the court of public opinion, in the court of Congress, and in the courts of law, where too often our decisions have been overturned because we didn't go through those hoops. Thunderbolts from above are not the way for an independent agency to make policy or to discharge its public interest obligations. So I believe such soul-searching benefits uh, or befits not just the FCC, but all of our independent regulatory agencies. And the new administration's open government initiative, uh, from what I know of it so far, is music to my ears and offers a wonderful opportunity to make this happen. So I guess to summarize what I've just said, we are a consumer protection agency and it's time to start acting like one. Let me move along now to the substance of what is happening at the uh, Commission. We have some very immediate challenges on the horizon, first and foremost being the digital television transition. Next week is not going to be pretty because roughly one third of our television stations still want to shut off their analog signals by midnight next Tuesday. So if you don't have cable or satellite or a digital TV set, if you're relying on rabbit ears or an outdoor antenna and an old analog set to receive your broadcast over the air, you will lose your picture unless you have obtained a converter box or your old analog set can handle those new digital signals. As most of you know, there's a Commerce Department run program to provide two coupons worth $40 each toward the purchase of two boxes for each household that applies. But the program ran out of money, which some of us predicted several weeks ago. So there's an enormous wait list that is now into the millions of coupons. As coupons go unredeemed, some money trickles back into the coupon program, and that means some coupons can trickle out but uh, demand is still far outstripping supply. The stimulus bill will provide more ample funding for the coupon program, but the stimulus bill has not yet been enacted, so that's gonna be a little bit time consuming. Over and above that, there are all sorts of problems that go far beyond just having a converter box, like is your antenna adequate for where you live? Or is the broadcaster's digital signal actually getting to you with the same robustness that the old analog signal came into your home? Or how do we get assistance out to vulnerable citizens like seniors and folks with disabilities and people for whom English is not their primary language and maybe they haven't gotten as much information about all of this? How do we actually get assistance into the homes? That's a Herculean job, but it's something that's got to be done. So the list of questions and the challenges and unmet needs just goes on and on and on. A couple of years ago, I called for a tightly organized, coordinated, from the top, led from the top, uh, interagency, public sector, private sector partnership to focus on the DTV transition, to leverage our various resources, to identify problems early, craft solutions early, and have systems up and running uh, long before now. Uh, that wasn't done. It's only in the last 20-some days, really, that we have uh, gotten that kind of coordinated uh, approach and coordinated from uh, on top uh, approach. 
So what I can tell you now is that there is going to be consumer dislocation and confusion come next week. And I don't think too many people are going to be introducing me as a hero in a week <laughs> because I'm associated with this, even though it's not the way I wanted to go. But the only thing worse than the dislocation and confusion that is coming next week would be the dislocation and confusion that would have happened had every station transitioned next Tuesday night. And Congress understood this. And as most of you know, Congress recently passed a delay bill saying that stations don't have to make this transition until June 12th. And that bill is predicated on the vast extent of consumer unreadiness. But it also provides flexibility, and this is a story that hadn't been told and kind of, uh, kind of requires uh, flexibility for stations to transition early if it serves the public interest and if they have really overarching reasons to do that. So our, our job now is to try to navigate through all of this, protect consumers, protect the spirit of that bill, and still provide uh, uh, the kind of opportunity for stations that really need to go uh, to go because both of those things are parts of the law. The good news is that some 63 percent of stations have decided to heed the spirit of the delay law and they will not end their analog broadcasting next week. But that still leaves some 490 or so stations that will be going ahead on top of those who already received special approval to transition earlier on, like in Wilmington, North Carolina, or Hawaii, where they have already done the uh, transition. So our, our next few days are pretty much spoken for at the FCC. We have to deal with uh, those who have expressed their intention to go ahead, weigh the costs of that to consumers, identify what stations will still be available on analog, and decide what to do if they are not, particularly in communities that are deemed especially vulnerable. That's quite an agenda, and it's not how I would have actually hoped to be spending my time as acting chairman. I want to focus for the remainder of my remarks on life after the DTV transition. To focus on the public interest agenda you and I have been talking about and dreaming about for so many years. How do we ensure true localism in our broadcast environment, especially in light of the damage that has been inflicted upon that environment by two decades of excessive media consolidation and mindless deregulation of the public interest? I believe we have a tremendous opportunity going forward to reinvigorate our media and ensure that the public airwaves truly deliver the kind of news and information that we need to sustain our democratic dialogue and to reflect the great diversity of our country, its races and ethnic groups and culture and music and arts. And I, for one, and I know you too, want to make sure these goals that you and I have worked so hard on remain front and center on the national agenda. Uh, we all recognize that economic times are tough and broadcasters are feeling it too, but even within the confines of a bad economy, there is much that can be done. Here I want to thank the Future Music Coalition and everyone in this room, really, for your leadership and counsel on these vital issues through the years. When the Commission first launched its last effort to loosen media concentration rules, and I hope it was the last effort to do that, more than 4,000 recording artists wrote us in opposition. In addition to platinum selling artists, many local musicians have stood up, spoken out, filed comments, and otherwise gone on the record to highlight the dangers of excessive media consolidation and the ills of excessive deregulation. Nobody, I guess, should have been surprised that you all stepped up. Recording and other creative artists have often been leaders for progressive change in our country, for our democracy in times of great social and political upheaval. And their music not only changed history, it really helps to illuminate the path before us. And I can't really pass up the, uh, the opportunity to once again thank uh, those who went on the Tell Us the Truth tour. What, what an experience that was. And I remember when we launched it in Madison, uh, Wisconsin. Uh, that was probably one of the most uh, 
uh, inspiring events, I think, that I've been privileged to uh, take part in. You're nodding your head here, so you, you remember. Uh, that, was, that was some experience and what a debt of gratitude we owe to those incredibly uh, busy artists who devoted their time and their resources to raise public awareness. Uh, and it worked. It worked at least to the extent that we were able to ward off some of the evils that were coming down the road pell-mell at us in the uh, rules that the then leader of the Federal Communications Commission wished to propound. And these musicians weren't doing it for money or because it would advance their careers. They were volunteering because they wanted to make America a better place to live, and they recognized the central role that media plays in our lives. You folks in music bring such a special perspective to this debate. You've lived through the consolidation and deregulation of the past three, 30 years, just about. You've seen your opportunities for airplay shrivel with the rise of national homogenized playlists. You know better than most that we just have to find ways to put the local back into radio. But we shouldn't just be talking about traditional, traditional commercial media. We also need to be talking about expanding outlets for airplay, including through community-based low-power FM stations and digital distribution through the internet. And we should be talking about ensuring that the internet does not race down the same road to consolidated control as happened in traditional media. Should anyone be telling you what you can read and see and hear on the internet? Which applications you can run? Which devices you can use? Today, there's increasing focus on protecting the dynamic character of the Internet. We view the Internet as a place of openness and accessibility where people can express themselves freely, where innovation and entrepreneurship can thrive, and where new worlds are available to each and every one of us. And we need to preserve this vibrant and opportunity creating an open Internet. And I believe the new administration, the new Congress, and the new FCC are going to find a way to make that happen. I hope our national debate on the future of the media doesn't become yet another one of those tired old arguments about regulation versus deregulation that has stultified so much discussion in the city and across the nation. All one needs to do is look at the nation's ailing financial sector to understand that we cannot just proceed pell-mell in the happy notion that markets will somehow solve all problems. Sometimes, and I think we all should know this now, markets create problems. And boy, have they created some whoppers this time. Sometimes we need the government to step in and provide some meaningful oversight and some public accountability. And if we learn one lesson from our present national crisis, that ought to be it. And I don't really understand how anyone can come to another conclusion. But I'm not suggesting that blind regulation is the answer either, any more than I was ever in favor of the blind deregulation that has plagued this town and our country for so much of the past 30 years. But if markets aren't working to produce what society really cares about, like media that reflects the true diversity and spirit of our country, then government has a legitimate role to play. Our goal should be firm, but we must always be pragmatic about how to achieve them. Like my hero, Franklin D. Roosevelt, we must be guided by the evidence. If something works, great. If it doesn't, try something else. Equally to the point, since tomorrow is the 200th anniversary of Abraham Lincoln's birth, we must disenthrall ourselves, as he said, think anew and act anew, and we have that opportunity now. We all need to be a part of the process. To succeed in our mission means including all stakeholders instead of trying to exclude them. We need to hear from anybody who has a stake in how these issues are resolved. In the media ownership debate, I learned so much more about what is going on in various media markets at grassroots hearings and town hall meetings and visiting with truly local broadcasters than I ever could have learned by sitting in my office in Washington and reading paper filings. When a regulatory agency is charged by the law with an important public policy matter, it has the obligation to reach out and explain and solicit citizen input. And I don't think that's too much to ask. And I would suggest that the industries at stake have a wonderful opportunity now to think about engaging 
in our dialogue. We want their input too, and hopefully as the discussion ensues, they will step forward and offer new ideas as to how we can improve our media. Many broadcasters are doing good and admirable jobs in their communities. And I really believe those that are don't want their good jobs diminished because some others have not performed so well. So I look forward to working with those folks too. It's in all of our interest to do that because change is on the way. This is not the time, and this would be my parting word, I guess, to my friends here, for us to slow down or just to assume that because we had an election and the Washington environment has changed that good results will automatically follow. But this may be the very best opportunity this country will have for decades to do something with the issues that you really care about. And if we really work together and pull together, all of us, consumers and advocates and musicians and artists and workers and regulators and concerned industry too, we can have a media of which we can all be proud, one that reflects and nourishes our diversity, one that educates and informs us as citizens, and one that provides a truly local voice to every local community. That's the public interest, and I think that public interest always needs to be your and my North Star. Thank you very much, and I wish you well in the rest of your meeting, and I enjoyed being with you.